Well, good morning, Oak Park Christian Church. It's so wonderful to have you here this morning. We are here to praise our God and to worship him. One of the ways, those ways that we do that is by lifting our voices, and he doesn't care how you sound. So would you please go ahead and stand and sing with us? big thank you to Noah for taking the baton and going forward. That banjo was Jeff Bueller's and we know that he's up there in heaven just you know singing and praising God and we just appreciate all the time that he was here investing in our young musicians and passing it forward. So amen. You know as we are here at it's with joy that we can think of Jeff and knowing, you know, we all have this hope through Christ Jesus. The love that we have here on this side of heaven and being able to build our life upon that love.
love is just the captain's dream.
Family of Father, we are here this morning, and we're putting our trust in you. No matter how crazy this world gets, we know it's not our home, that we have something so much better waiting for us on the other side, and it's all because of Jesus Christ, and it's in his precious name that we pray, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. So good to be with you today. Glad that you're here and glad that you remember we're opening between Easter and Christmas as well. So very good to be with you today. And a very special welcome and thanks for being here to those who are watching on our live stream on YouTube this morning. So glad that you're a part of the Oak Park family as well. Remember, you can text in prayer praises, prayer requests, comments, please be nice, and questions to 805-481-7092. And uh, you can also text in some pictures of you uh, watching the service from home. We're going to have a little bit of a collage uh, highlighting some of our online viewers uh, next week. So text those in to the very same number, 805-481-7092. All right, our scripture this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 1. A little bit of a longer text, but I wanted to give, get, get you some good context for what we're going to be talking about today. This is God's word to us this morning. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates The Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Father God, may you honor the reading of your word this morning with understanding and with the gift of faith and obedience today as well. Lord, as you know every person here listening, you know every person watching and listening, you know the backstory, you know the life circumstances, the struggles, the successes, the victories, the vanities, and uh, the pain and everything else. Lord, I pray that today in these moments of worship that your spirit will speak your truth into each of our lives Lord, may each of us hear what it is we need to hear from you this day, and as you speak, may we, may we truly listen, and listen not to just gloss over or explain away or, or, or to treat lightly the things of your word and your kingdom, but Lord, to truly take them to heart, and Lord, of course, this is through the work of your spirit active in, in us. But I pray for that which is our part, the, the, the setting aside of the setting aside of our worries and our preoccupations, Lord, I pray that in these moments we will avail ourselves to you. Lord, I pray that you will convict those who need to be convicted of their, of their choices, their actions, and their words, and their, their motivations. Lord, I pray that you will comfort those who are broken and hurting because of, well, because of personal actions or because of the actions others have done to them. Lord, I pray for all of us to be, to be motivated, to be compelled to deeper faith, deeper action, a, a riskier love for you, Lord, as we speak and as we serve and as we sacrifice and as we give. Lord, I just pray for, for deeper devotion. And as always, Lord God, I ask that my words don't get in the way of your word, but that you speak, that you work, that you bring glory to yourself as Jesus is focused on 
and in this text, quite literally, lifted up before us. These things we pray in his name. Our Savior, our Lord, your Son, O Father God, the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, before we get into our text today, uh, which is uh, the next in our series on going through the book Core 52, the the essential passages of Scripture that in the course of a year will give us a a very deep and a complete understanding of the meaning and the message of the Bible. And if you haven't picked up your copy of that, I would encourage you to do so. They're available at the Welcome Center uh, after service. Or if you're online, you can uh, can email in or you can uh, stop by the office during the week and pick up your copy of that uh, fantastic book. Uh, so we're working, through, we're working our way through that, and what comes naturally after the, the, the resurrection of Jesus, which we celebrated last week, is the, the next big event, which is the ascension of Jesus, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, for those of you who were here last Sunday, it was Resurrection Sunday, fantastic day. The building was packed for both services. It was great to, to be back to normal in that sense uh, of, of worshiping together and experiencing a, a, just a regular uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, and that part of regular Easter Sunday was great. But we had an aspect last week that, that many of you, even in second service, missed out on at the last part of the service. And that is we had a, we had a latecomer, a very special guest who came in at the end of service. And he was a, 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 tad, a tad agitated, a tad mentally uh, unstable. And he, uh, we had the side door open for, for airflow, and he, he came in right at the end of service, and some of the guys in the congregation noticed him, and they already had their, their radar up, and I noticed they came in too, and so when I'm down in front, I said to Greg, I'm like, we got to watch the guy by the door, and Greg's like, okay. So after that, we, Greg and I have our normal prayer time, we're praying with people, and, and right after I talked to someone and prayed for them, um, all of a sudden they're shouting from the stage. And so I turn around and this guy had made his way to the stage and he's yelling, pay attention to me, everybody listen up. And then he was beginning to spout some kind of kind of weird conspiracy theory, something or another. So I immediately turn around, tell him to get off the stage. He can't speak. He doesn't have that permission. And he's like, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not stopping and I'm not getting off the stage. So I come up on the stage and in the the, the gentle, loving, pastoral manner that I have. I, I placed my hand on his shoulder. Um, he proceeded to say that I and this entire congregation are under the influence of demons and that I was to get, um, get my uh, expletive deleted hands uh, off of him, uh, which he yelled fairly loudly. And in that moment, there was a, there was a look in his eyes and I knew this was gonna be the day that Pastor Mike gets hit. Uh, Pastor Mike's getting decked, and I was pretty certain that the live stream was still going, so it was going to be on the internet. Wouldn't that have been fun? So fortunately, Billy is right on top of things, and that feed was cut just about a minute before the dude almost decked me. Now, as I said, he, he was just very agitated, he was very unstable, so as I saw that look in his eyes and as he's cussing at me and saying a few other things, I immediately just dropped my hand, made a fist just to be prepared to defend myself. I distracted him with the left hand, high shiny thing over here. But in those moments, immediately there was a wall of men here. It was awesome. Some of the biggest guys attending church that day were down here. Uh, Rick Smith had come up on stage and had positioned himself ever so discreetly between the gentleman and Cheryl, so he was going to protect Cheryl. There was a, a number of guys right down here, and I'm like, guys, you can come a little bit closer. You don't need to be, you don't need to be four feet away. You can be two feet away. And immediately as, as the men saw, or as the guy saw those other men, his personality and his attitude mellowed significantly. He really, really did calm down. And then it went into went into information I needed to share with the church about, as I said, some conspiracy theory and some website that I needed to check out and all of that. And he was, as I said, very agitated, and uh, everything went on without incident after that. The, the, the highlight of the day, though, and I'm going to give Cheryl a shout-out for this if she's listening in her office. As the guy is on stage and as he starts yelling, Cheryl just immediately yelled out to the other band members, play louder. And man, they cranked up the volume, and I'm like, why is the music so loud? But they were doing great. Half the people here at the end of second service didn't even know anything was happening. The other half who were paying attention, the guys had my back. Greatly appreciate that, and that was pretty awesome. So um, 
Overall, a pretty amazing Resurrection Sunday, even with a little bit of added excitement there at the end. So, so lots of fun. You just never know what you're going to expect when you come to church at Oak Park. Anyway, and our text today, such a key uh, essential part of the, the kind of the, the, the completion of the earthly life and the ministry of Jesus. And it's not something we, we talk about a whole lot because, well, let's, let's admit it's, it's a little bit of a weird story. And we've already dealt with this weirdness of Jesus coming back to life from the dead. And so the whole concept of resurrection is, is, is a little bit hard to believe in the first place. And, of course, the resurrection along with the crucifixion, those are the two cornerstones. Those are the two foundations of our faith. As I say, they're the, they're the two rails upon which we, which we ride along in life. Jesus dying for our sins on the cross and rising from the dead. I mean, that's, those are the rails that guide us forward. Those are the, the salvific events in history. But after the resurrection, a significantly time after, Jesus ascended to heaven. And the ascension is kind of, as I said, it's, it's an, a little bit of an unusual story. It's a little bit of an unusual concept. But in the overall scope of stricture, stru- Scripture and in the structure of the life and ministry of Jesus, it actually makes perfect sense. So what exactly is the ascension? Well, after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus appeared periodically or sporadically to various groups of disciples over a 40-day period. Why didn't Jesus, once he was returned to life, why didn't he just stick around? After all, wouldn't that have been a, that would have been a fantastic ongoing 40-day straight party. It would have been raging. It would have been awesome. Jesus chose not to do that, though. Jesus chose to, to appear intermittently to various groups of disciples. And I, and I think part of the reasoning for that is it's going to prove one of his points later on. So Jesus appeared sporadically to various groups of disciples. The whole 40-day period thing, very significant biblically. If you look at the beginning of the the, the Hebrew scriptures all the way through the the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, 40 days has always been something very specially marked within scripture as having significance. Biblically, it's it's a period of testing, a period of preparation. We go back all the way to Genesis and that, that whole 40-day period, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. We look at Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. He was, he was on the mountain uh, communing and hearing from God for a period of 40 days. As the Israelites prepared to, to go into the promised land, as they were perched there on the entrance of the promised land, they sent out the spies. And the spies were in the land for 40 days, surveilling all the, the different peoples who had, were occupying that place. Goliath, the giant, taunted the army of Israel for 40 days, and the army of Israel cowered before him. Even in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus, after his baptism, went into the wilderness for a period of of fasting and a period of prayer. And it was there that he was tempted by Satan on numerous occasions. But once again, that period was 40 days. 40 days is a a biblical time of of testing, trials, and then preparation as well. Seems to be a very complete period of testing. So that's what we have, 40 days Jesus appeared to his disciples intermittently over that time period. Before we, want to get, into, before we get into that, I want to look one thing about, about a little bit more of the background of, of who wrote this and why this is so important. This is the beginning of the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is a, is a detailing of the, the, the initial history of the people of Jesus, the apostles and the followers of Jesus, immediately after Jesus resurrection, ascension, and then that ministry in the early church. How the the early church, how how people became Christians by the hundreds and by the thousands within the first few years of Jesus returning to life. The book of Acts is written by a man named Luke. Luke was not one of Jesus' disciples. He was not an apostle. Luke wasn't even Jewish. Luke was a Gentile doctor. He was from Syrian Antioch. And he as a Gentile, perhaps, was one of the first converts. He wasn't religious by nature, per se, at least from what we know of him. He was a physician. He was a medical doctor. He was a Gentile doctor who had come to faith in Jesus. 
And it's possible that there was a great wave of, of Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus in those early years. And it's very possible that Luke was among that first wave of Gentiles to become Christians. We don't know. But as he became a Christian, he became enamored with Jesus. And given his medical training and his professional background, he, not only for himself, but for friends and for his circle and his dear friend Theophilus, um, which simply means lover of God, Luke wanted to, to account for everything that he had heard about Jesus. So Luke begins the process of writing his doctoral thesis, so to speak, on the life and the ministry of Jesus. He goes and interviews those who were there. He extensively researches what Jesus said and, and what he did and what was said about him. And that's how he compiles his gospel. He says it's an orderly account of the life of Jesus. And some of the snippets he includes in there are snippets that can only come from eyewitness testimony. Little subtle things that Luke works into the story of Jesus. After the Gospel of Luke, the second volume, the continuation of the ministry of Jesus, so to speak, is what we have here in the book of Acts. Now, for the Gospel of Luke, Luke required research. For the initial time period listed here in the book of Acts, he needed research. He had to interview the witnesses. But about two-thirds of the way through the book, something really interesting happens. You see, all of a sudden, it shifts from they to we. The last part of the book of Acts is not just research. It's not just history. It's not just compiled from the interviews. It's personal living history that Luke records. It is his personal experience. After Luke did become a disciple of Jesus, he believed that Jesus died for his sins and he rose from the dead and he pledged his life to Jesus. He actually became a part of Paul's traveling evangelistic team, Paul's entourage, so to speak. As they went over so many different portions of the ancient world and they preached and planted churches and they suffered together, Luke was a part of that, and it's great. Paul, who evidently did have a lot of physical problems, he had a traveling personal physician with him. That's pretty awesome. And so Luke was probably his personal doctor. In the letter that Paul writes to the church in Colossae, as he's sending his last early, the greetings there at the end of the letter, he said, Luke, the beloved physician, sends his greetings. Luke was a beloved member of Paul's team. We get a deeper insight into this man named Luke because in the, the book of 2 Timothy, and 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul writes. It is written perhaps days, maybe just a few weeks before he was executed for being a Christian. And as, his, as he's pouring out his heart in that book of 2 Timothy, he's writing to his, one of his disciples named Timothy, who was a young pastor. Paul takes, the, takes the, the time to include in that letter these words, only Luke is with me. Paul's traveling entourage was, was pretty large at times. Now, some had deserted him, some had, some had abandoned him. You know, when the going gets tough, the, well, the week get going. And others had been sent by Paul to other places to strengthen churches and to continue preaching. And so Paul is there, and as Paul is, is facing his own execution, as, as he is there waiting to be put to death, Luke is the one who remains by his side. Now, he appeals to Timothy to, to come and, and, and to be with him as well. And we don't know if Timothy made it in time or not. But in those moments before he died, Luke is the man with Paul. And if Paul had any doubts about Jesus, don't you think he would have shared them with Luke? But instead, in those moments, those, that awaiting of execution solidified Paul's faith and belief and devotion to Jesus. And Luke was right there with him. After Jesus returned from the dead, I said there's, there's, there's these periodic, intermittent, occasional meetings with disciples and different groups of disciples. The Gospels don't detail them a whole lot. This is very, very general. There's a couple of stories. But for the most part, these, these multiple appearances over 40 days are not recorded in Scripture. 
even here at the beginning of the book, Luke just sums them up as he appeared to his disciples with many convincing proofs. The word convincing proofs is it's a pretty unusual word. It's a very precise word in the Greek language. It means evidences, confirmed evidence, the kind of stuff that would uphold in a court of law. Those convincing proofs, it means verified evidence. So there wasn't a whole need to explain in detail a lot of things. The evidence was already there. And those post-resurrection appearances to so many various groups of disciples, it expanded the, the base of eyewitnesses, those eyewitnesses who would live well into A.D. 50, A.D. 60, and possibly beyond When so many other letters in the New Testament were written, there were still people living who had seen Jesus alive, and they were still there sharing their stories. So Luke is convinced. Luke did the research. Luke truly did believe in Jesus without seeing Jesus. So his testimony and his witness is pretty important and essential for us who also believe without seeing, per se. So Luke records this event that's called the ascension, the ascending of Jesus from earth into heaven. It takes place on the Mount of Olives, just a short distance outside the city of Jerusalem. And evidently at the end of the 40-day period, Jesus has met and he had taught with his disciples. And well, the period of testing and the period of preparation was done, it was time for Jesus to, to complete his ministry on earth and return to heaven. So in this miraculous, and it's, 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 it's kind of weird, and it's almost unbelievable story to, to, to understand and to comprehend, Jesus is, is suddenly elevated and lifted off the ground and goes up into the sky while disciples are staying there watching. Luke records that as Jesus is off the, off the ground, we don't know how high. It's most likely not the, not the cloud cover that we see because that's, you know, that's, that's way up there and Jesus would be just a little tiny speck. They would barely be able to see him anyway. It's most likely a lot closer to the ground but still in the air that a cloud surrounds Jesus and he is enveloped in the cloud and disappears in the cloud. That cloud is most likely the cloud of God's glory that we see in the book of Exodus, that we see at the the time of transfiguration in the ministry of Jesus. The cloud of God's glory that surrounded him and and transformed Jesus' appearance once again appears and Jesus is transformed and he is translated from his earthly body into his heavenly body in its complete stage. Now the, the ascension is a somewhat logical conclusion to the life and the ministry of Jesus. It also fulfills prophecy. There's Old Testament prophecies about the the king ascending to heaven. It is a fulfillment of prophecy in Jesus' own teachings as well, that he would be be caught up, that he would ascend into heaven. But it's still pretty weird to believe. It's kind of a kind of a kind of a hard to believe thing. Now I mean if you believe Jesus walked out of the tomb, that's that's far harder to believe. But Jesus ascended and it's a kind of it's a core essential Christian truth. The ascension marked the official end of Jesus incarnational ministry, his life and ministry as God in the flesh, as having a completely only human physical body. Marks the end of that incarnational ministry. And as Jesus marks that end, <coughs> excuse me, the disciples were then commanded to wait for God the Holy Spirit to come in his place. So Jesus ascends into heaven. What's Jesus doing in heaven? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked, and I'm glad I answered it in the notes. Jesus' current ministry in heaven. After the ascension, Jesus ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and then he sits down, and that's a very ceremonial, very symbolic position of power and authority. And that's the power and the authority that Jesus has. Jesus truly is king. This is his coronation to kingship. Jesus is reigning from heaven right now. He is reigning over a very rebellious world that is in spiritual chaos and spiritual conflict. But the kingdom of God that Jesus initiated is the leaven that comes into the, to the dough and the yeast of this world. And it is what works 
the wisdom and the way of God in the midst of so much chaos and confusion and utter rebellion against him. The influence and the authority of Jesus continues to expand and continues to transform societies. That work continues to this day. But in addition to Jesus as king and and ultimately bringing everything under his control, what else is Jesus doing right now? We see in Scripture that he is preparing a place for us. He is preparing our heavenly home. Very famous passage in John chapter 14. I'm going to go to heaven, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my, my Father's house are, are many rooms. It's, 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 it's imagery about where our heavenly dwelling is going to be and, and what it's going to be like in the presence of God. Now, obviously, after 2,000 years, Jesus is evidently on typical contractor time to prepare that place. Always takes longer than we expect or we want. I'm a former contractor, I understand that. So Jesus has been working on this for 2,000 years. But if you also think about it, he's got a lot of work to do to keep up with those who keep becoming Christians. Because every day, more than 100,000 people place their faith in Christ. So he's busy working. Not only is he reigning as king, he's preparing our heavenly home. He is also preparing our personalized reward for righteousness. And, and this is, don't take me wrong on this, this is not a, you know, a, a be good to get good type of thing from God. It's not a checklist to check off of, I've got to be a, I've got to be a, you know, a, a good person in a goody two-shoes and righteous and holy in order to, to, to await my reward. It's not that, that, that give to get type of, type of approach. It's, it's how we naturally act when we, are, we are, when we are in love, when we are grateful, when we are thankful. And God promises reward. What will those rewards be? Well, the language of, of Scripture is kind of very vague. There's a, there, you know, there's a crown of righteousness and there's a new robe and a new name and some of those things about being utterly transformed and, and enjoying the presence of God. But there will be personalized rewards, which means God is paying attention. And his, his eye is not on you just to you know, stand there and, and make sure you stay in line. But his eye is on you because he cares, because he is watching because he is protective. Do you ever had parents, you know, the first day your, your, parent, your, your, your kids walk to the bus or walk to the park by themselves, what do you do? You followed them. You stayed out of sight. Well, at least, at least good parents did. No, I'm just kidding. But when, when, you're, when, you're, when your child is, 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 is lurching out on their own for the very first time, don't you, don't you try to watch, don't you worry, don't you fret. No, oh, that's God as our heavenly Father watching over us. So God is, or Jesus is preparing a place for us. But Jesus is also interceding, and this is one of the most important ministries and the most comforting ministries of Jesus. He is interceding us from the place at the right hand of God. Jesus is speaking to God the Father on our behalf, and he has to do that because there's someone else who is saying something else about us. And that's the accuser. One of the, most, one of the most descriptive terms of Satan, the adversary of God, is that he is the accuser of the brethren. And the, as the accuser, he is constantly nagging God the Father about our faults, our failures, our inadequacies, our intentional sins, our unintentional sins. Constantly saying, are you seeing what they're doing? How could you love them? How could you forgive them? And in every single instance, Jesus is there advocating on our behalf. He is our, he is our defender. He is saying everything they have done has already been paid for. I have completed the work I was sent to do on the cross. They are forgiven in every instance. If you think about that, when you let yourself down or when you, when you, when you know you let God down and all of a sudden you have that, that, that guilty conscience or that that, that pang of guilt. And those are good things, and the Holy Spirit can definitely use those things in our lives. But think about it in this moment, that time you, you, you let the, the word or the words slip that you just shouldn't have said, and they were, they were stupid, they were wrong, they were hurtful. You know Satan's going to seize on those words. God, did you, did you just hear what they said? How in the world can you love them if they're going to speak like that? 
in that very moment, even as our conscience may be working, even as the Holy Spirit may be working internally on us, the accuser has seized on that moment. Jesus is defending us. And that forgiveness is complete. Jesus is, is, is interesting. He is speaking to God the Father on our behalf. The Apostle Paul writes, who is there to condemn? A rhetorical question. Nobody is really there to condemn. Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I'm sure I keep Jesus plenty busy in the course of a normal day, and I'm sure you do as well. So Jesus has a lot to do. He's a very busy, he's a very busy man. He's a very busy God. But that happens because the ascension, as he ascends to the right hand of God the Father, this was the position, the place in the plan of God for him to intercede for us. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus, as he's having one last, last crash course with the disciples, explaining everything that's going to happen and, and why it's necessary for him to be crucified and why it's necessary for him to leave. He says it's important for him to leave so that God can send the Holy Spirit. And you see, Jesus, even though he was God, there are limitations even for God in time and space. Now, nothing is impossible for God. I'm not, not saying that. But Jesus, as God in the flesh, there's only so many hours in the day. We see this in his ministry. As he was healing people, the crowds kept coming, and the disciples were so concerned that he was, he was exhausting himself because he was healing people late into the night on numerous occasions. And can you imagine if Jesus had just stayed here on this earth in the body and had set up shop in Jerusalem and had established a kingdom and a throne? What would the line be like to see Jesus and get your three seconds with Jesus? Currently today, there are something like 1.6 billion followers of Jesus on this planet. It increases by over 100,000 people a day. That's longer than the line at Vaughn's. I, I, I do have to, I have to pick on a Vons because they're the close. That's, the one I, that's where I always shop. Yeah, Vons and Costco receive most of my wrath from the pulpit. But Jesus had to leave so that the, the, those physical limitations of him being in a body and in a certain place, in a certain location at a set time, those could be transcended by God the Holy Spirit being released into the world. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, for people all over the planet, is at work convicting of sin, leading us to faith, converting us from death to life, may, taking us from old to new in Christ, our spiritual rebirth. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who then consecrates us, who, who sets us apart for holy living. That's why, we are, that's why we care about the things of God and are concerned about what God's Word says. And God the Holy Spirit is ever so gentle and ever so patient in working with us through those things. It is God the Holy Spirit who confers upon us as individual believers spiritual gifts so that we can love God and serve God and be useful to God in the church and in the world. God the Holy Spirit takes the natural abilities we have and enhances them, but then he also gives us specific things to be able to do to serve in the body of Christ, the church, to build it up. It is the Holy Spirit who cultivates our fruit of character, our fruit of good works. There is very, very limited success in simple self-help or, or simple other gurus or life coaches being able to cultivate the fruit of a changed heart, a changed disposition, transformed motivations that comes from the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who then takes our works and, and, and multiplies them and blesses them beyond just the, the, the physical acts in a, in a moment in times and turns them into something eternally significant. That's the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who, who conforms us to maturity of Christ's likeness. It is the Holy Spirit who, who helps us grow up and follow Jesus better. 
Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's for your advantage that I go away. And that advantage is that as he goes, the Holy Spirit then comes. And in Jesus, God was with us, Emmanuel, God with us. As he has then ascended to heaven and is at the right hand of God, God the Holy Spirit comes and God is no longer just with us, God is in us, dwelling within our hearts through faith. Galatians 4, 6, because you are his sons, because we are his children, God has spent, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father a personal relationship with a heavenly Father who loves us, who knows us, who forgives us, who indwells us, who transforms us, and who secures us for heaven. It was so essential for Jesus to ascend, to return to heaven so that the Spirit could come and do his amazing work within us. And lastly, the ascension of Jesus is so important because it gives us a picture of Jesus' ultimate final return to this earth. Yes, Jesus will return. And the ascension sets the stage for that. His return will be in the same unmistakable, visible manner in which he left. He will come in the clouds. He will descend from heaven. And it's kind of incredible to think about for that. Because the Bible says every eye will see and every ear will hear. How in the world can we see and we hear something happening in Jerusalem on the other side of the world? Now there's lots of, there's lots of craziness out there on speculation about when Jesus is going to return, what the last days are going to look like and all of that. And, and I want to bypass some of, that, some of that craziness and let's just, let's just cut to the chase. Jesus will eventually return. He has kept every other promise. That's the last promise to keep. The scriptures say that God is patient in delaying, patient with us, delaying the return of Jesus so that more people will come to repentance. And as I said, more than 100,000 people a day find new life in Jesus. And that number is increasing, by the way. So God's patience is well rewarded. But we live in a day and an age and we're already in the last days. We've been in the last days since, since Jesus rose from the dead. That's what the scriptures say. But we live in a day and an age. But because of our technology, because of our modern inventions, we live in a moment where something that happens in Jerusalem can be instantaneously, real time, seen and heard and experienced around the world. Now, if Jesus does return in our lifetime and say it's any day now and Jesus begins descending from heaven, there will, be, there will be video, there will be people on the internet, there will be phones, there will be news crews covering that. Probably not CNN and MSNBC, but we can, we can always hope. I'm just kidding on that. Don't, don't take it too seriously. No hate email, plays, please, it's just a joke. But we live in a day and age where our technology has made it possible for every eye and every ear on this planet to experience the return of Jesus, a very literal fulfillment of what was promised 2,000 years ago. It's pretty amazing to think about. Speaking of the return of Jesus, Jesus said that before he returns, the gospel would have to be preached in all nations. The gospel would be preached in all nations, and then the end would come. If you look at the term all nations, it's really the words ta ethni, the ethnics, the ethnicities. The gospel must be preached to every ethnicity, every people group, then the end will come. Here's another incredible, overwhelming, encouraging thing about the day and age we live in. The missiologists, the people who, who study the advancement of, of the gospel and, and how many people groups have been reached and how many people groups remain to be reached, there, there's concerted efforts to get the scriptures translated into the, the native languages of, of every, every main language on earth. And here's the incredible thing. If you break it down into the most literal as to every ethnicity, the, nearly every language on earth is known now. There may be a few, a few tribes that are still, still out there that, that are not known to modern linguists. But because of the concerted efforts of Scripture translation, particularly in the last 100 years, 
Within the next few years, every single language group, every single language subset will have at least a portion of the written scriptures in their language. May not be the complete New Testament, the complete Bible, but there will be portions of the gospel. The message of Jesus dying for sin and rising from death for new life, that message will be available to every known language group on this planet within the next few years. So if that is an extremely literal interpretation of Scripture, that's a pretty remarkable thing to expect and to look for. And of course, God's on the throne, it's God's timing, it's not ours, God will decide. But his patience is well rewarded by the faithful work of his church. The gospel must be preached, Jesus must be lifted up, we must must continue to explain and appeal our faith, appeal to those others about our faith in Jesus. As Jesus ascended, He will descend. And if that descent happens within our days, may we be found faithful. Faithful in loving God and loving one another and loving our neighbor and loving our enemies. May we be found faithful in continuing to serve sacrificially and to give wholeheartedly, to love indiscriminately, to plead with all of our earnestness Come to Jesus, be forgiven, be transformed, be included in the family. May we be found faithful. I'd like to have Cheryl and the team come back out on the stage as we prepare for communion. And obviously this is a, this is, this is a little bit of a more unusual aspect of the life and the ministry of Jesus. But one thing I did forget to mention in the notes that Luke, as he records this, there's, there's lots of other stories of, of religious figures ascending to heaven. The way Luke does it here is, is very different compared to those. He's very, he's very direct. He's very subtle. He's very matter-of-fact. It doesn't include all the fantastical, um, you know, um, tidbits of the story. But Luke also wrote this while there were still living witnesses. Gives us the the ring of truth. So take comfort that Jesus has ascended. He is reigning. He is ruling. He is preparing. He is interceding. And he is returning. Communion is what centers us. And if you'll take your elements and prepare them, we'll share communion together in a few moments. Communion is what centers us on the work of Jesus. We take bread because it symbolizes the body of Jesus that took our sin We partake of juice because it represents his blood that was poured out so that we could be forgiven. And it also represents the body and blood of Jesus that was reunited, returned to life by God the Father so that victory over death could be accomplished. Communion is intensely personal. It is communing with God. But it is also very communal and very corporate. We do this together. It is a shared experience, and yet is also intensely personal. Spend this time in prayer. Repent of sin, renew faith, rejoice in forgiveness, whatever it may be. Spend a few moments in reflection, and then we will partake together. of our liturgy are found from the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. These words have guided Christians in this very same practice for 2,000 years now. They will continue to guide us. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In remembrance of Jesus taking our sin in his body on the cross, we partake. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of Jesus taking or paying the price for our sin, we partake. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Would you please stand with me? And in sharing in this together as the family of God at the Oak Park Christian Church, together we affirm our faith in the crucifixion of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, our faith in the resurrection of Jesus from death for the gift of eternal life, and our shared abiding hope of eternity with the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, all we can... All we can say is how grateful and thankful we are for your love, for your sacrifice, for the life that you offer, for your very patient and gracious work continuing in us and continuing through us. Lord, may we be found faithful until we see you face to face, whether that's at the end of our days or the end of all days. May we be found faithful in our love for you, Lord Jesus. Amen.
bendecida. All right, I've got a few announcements for us this morning. The first one is I encourage you to take your bulletins out. And inside your bulletin is a little sheet here that says connection card. Uh, some of you have been attending for quite a while and you've never filled one out. Today's the day. All right. Some of you, this is your first time here. Uh, we would love for you to fill this out. We'd love to come alongside and encourage you. But we promise we're not going to show up at your house. Um, this is just for us to be able to let you know things that are coming up, to be able to pray for you, um, just things like that. On the back, you'll notice that there's a praise and prayer uh, sheet. We'd also love to hear what God's doing in your life and celebrate those with you, and then also uh, be able to uh, pray for you if you've got requests. Uh, Pastor Mike and I will be up here in the front if you'd like to do that today and have a one of us pray for you, or you have a question or you need to talk, we'd love to do that with you. The, uh, the, the sheet is also a great way to let us know if, uh, if you would like to um, check any of those boxes. And you could make your own box, too, if, the, if there's one not listed there. You know, there's becoming a believer there's, uh, that you'd like to um, get baptized, things like that. That's all on there, but uh, you might have a different need and uh, just write that in there so we know. The, uh, there you go. Uh, you can also let us know if any of your information has changed. You can fill that out and let the office know so we have your current email address. And uh, that would be great for when we send out the, the mailings. The Core 52 books are available at the Welcome Center, uh, along with the updated reading schedule bookmarks. Uh, this Saturday is our men's breakfast, our, our bacon, Bible, and brotherhood, and bacon's listed first. Yeah, it's off of, yeah, for those of you that are CDO, it's, uh, it's alphabetical. The, it's actually the Bible's first, but we do eat a lot of bacon. So uh, if you're going to show up to that, if you're high school age or older, and you'd like to come, it's 8 to 9.30 up in the fellowship hall, and just on your connection card, just kind of note that so we know how much bacon to make, all right? We got, we got to make sure. Tim always has like 10 slices, so um, got, to, got, to, got to know how much to make. For our Oak Park family, join us on YouTube. Uh, you can text prayer request, as Pastor Mike mentioned at the beginning, to 805-481-7092. And you can also use that number for email updates, uh, community group info, or to order the Core 52 books. You can text the request and send the pictures to 805-481-7092. Uh, That's the uh, modern church right there. So we're going to be doing this for quite a while, I think. So it's, it's good. It can reach a lot more people. The uh, offering, the offering trays are on the greeters' tables by each door for uh, your tithes and offerings uh, on your way out, and also for your connection cards and the praise and prayer inserts. And uh, you can also see your bulletin or the screen for other ways that you can give. And so uh, why don't you go ahead and stand on up to your feet. I'm going to close this in prayer, and uh, then we're going to have a, a short closing song. But I encourage you on your way out to say hi to someone you've never seen. Uh, it might be someone that's attended for years. I make that mistake all the time and say, hey, I've never met you. And like, oh, I was here before you. Okay, sorry. Um, but it's always good to say hi to someone you don't usually say hi to. So uh, we might even have someone here from Montana this morning, I think. We might. So, yeah. Let me, uh, let me pray for us. God, I, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for what you're doing in our, our body, what you're doing in our lives, our hearts. Thank you for the word this morning that we can always uh, be pointed back to what, what's really important. We've got so many things uh, pulling for our time in life, and we know that anything with you is uh, the best thing we can choose. And so pray that this week would be a week that we let you have more of our, our hearts and minds and our lives. Uh, we thank you so much for going to the cross for us, for dying for us, for taking our sin, for loving us, and uh, we just want to tell you that we love you. Amen.
storm, I am holding on now. 